In this video, I'm gonna walk you through five essential tips that will show you how to get more cinematic results from your drone footage. I've done some extensive filming with my E2S drone for both brand and personal projects, which has taught me a lot about drone settings, camera movements, and conditions that produce the best results, which I'll guide you through. Before we even get into filming, we need to make sure your drone is set up correctly. If you want to get those nice and natural, smooth looking shots like you see in the movies, you need to use a certain formula that involves your drone's shutter speed and frame rate. To adjust these settings, first we need to switch the drone from automatic mode to pro mode. This will allow us to select a specific shutter speed which your drone needs to stay at. If we leave it in automatic mode, the drone will vary the shutter speed to suit the conditions that it's in, which is not what we want. Our shutter speed needs to be double the value of a frame rate. So here I'm going to select 25 frames per second, and I'm going to make the shutter speed 50. Films are generally shot in 24 frames per second, which is the lowest frame rate that can be achieved in order to make motion look natural to the human eye. The reason I choose to use 25 frames per second is because I have a GoPro and DSLR camera, which I use the same frame rate across. It's important that you use the same frame rate across all your footage, so when it comes to editing, everything is consistent. From my understanding, there's no visual difference between 24 and 25 frames per second. It just comes down to personal preference or any technical or production requirements. If you want to achieve slow motion footage, then the same double formula applies. This means if you're shooting at 25 frames per second, you'll now need to double your frame rate to 50 and set the shutter speed to 100. Now when I drag that 50 frames per second clip into my editing timeline and halve the speed, the clip will now effectively be running at 25 frames per second as it has doubled in length and is 50% slower. You may have noticed when I was changing the shutter speed that the exposure of the camera was changing. A lower shutter speed means the shutter of the camera is more open, which lets more light in. A higher shutter speed requires the shutter to close in more, which lets in less light. More likely than not, when you're shooting in these fixed frame rates and shutter speeds, your camera will be overexposed. To compensate for this, we need to use neutral density filters, which are known as ND filters. They're effectively sunglasses for your camera. If you have the DJI Air 2S, you'll have a set of four filters that it came with. The filters range from ND4 to 32, with 4 being the lightest, and 32 being the darkest. To determine which ND filter you'll need to use, all you have to do is pick up your drone and point it to the brightest part of the scene you'll be filming. You can then experiment by holding different ND filters over the camera to see which one best compensates for the overexposure. You can use the exposure meter to see if your camera is under or overexposed. I aim for between 0 and 1, so ideally pick an ND filter within that range. You can see which areas of the image are overexposed by referring to the zebra lines. A few of these, like in this example, are fine, but if they start to eat up a lot of your image, you need to go for a darker ND filter. If you're shooting at night and in dark conditions, or if the light changes on you suddenly mid-flight, you can compensate for this by increasing your ISO. Just be aware that the higher the ISO, the more grain will be introduced into your image, so always keep it as low as possible. Finally, I recommend shooting in the color profile D-Log, this will create a greyer, flatter looking image, but it will give you more dynamic range when it comes to grading. My next tip is the fun part, controlling your drone and camera. I'll walk you through everything from basic techniques to advanced ones. Your drone is controlled by two joysticks and the camera gimbal. To start simple, let's go through some basic one joystick shots. The left joystick moves the drone up, down, and rotates it. An example of a shot that uses the left joystick is an upward reveal or crane shot. Here I'm using the left stick to raise the drone, revealing the subject in the setting. Another example is a pan shot. This pushes the left joystick either left or right to pan horizontally across your setting. The right stick is used to move the drone forwards, backwards and side to side. A really easy but effective shot is to fly your drone forwards over a setting. Getting the drone low to the ground will make for a more dramatic shot, as it gives an increased sense of speed. Another easy right stick example is to fly your drone sideways. Using this movement you can get creative to reveal parts of your scene, like in this example. Once you've got the hang of that, you can now try and experiment with two movement shots. This could either use both sticks, or one stick and the gimbal. One of my favourite shots is the orbit shot. This uses both sticks in opposing sideways directions to move around your subject. An example that uses one stick and the gimbal is the tilt reveal shot. 
You can achieve this by flying your drone forwards and then carefully rotating your gimbal up to reveal the subject or setting. Generally speaking, the more controls you use when shooting, the more unique and dynamic your shots will be. Let's take a look at some shots that are captured that use both sticks and the gimbal at the same time. These shots do take a lot of practice, but they're great fun to experiment and get creative with. In regards to shoot modes, your drone has three options, Cine, Normal and Sport. I use Normal by default, but there are certain instances where I need the drone movements to be slower and easier to control when I'm close to surrounding objects, and that's where the Cine mode comes in handy. This mode is especially helpful for smoothing out gimbal movements, which can be challenging. I only use Sport mode if I need to get my drone somewhere in a hurry, or if I need to create a strong sense of speed in my shot. Just be careful in this mode as the motion sensors will be switched off, which means your drone won't be able to avoid obstacles and is more likely to crash. For my third tip, I'm briefly going to touch on active tracking, which is a really amazing piece of technology. Active tracking allows you to lock onto a subject or object, so you can capture shots either hands-free or with limited control movements since the drone is assisting you. If you're like me, I'm usually getting shots of myself driving, hiking and exploring. With active tracking, I'm able to lock onto myself and get the drone to follow me so I can do these activities without having to touch the controls. You can also use the point of interest mode so you can orbit around subjects and objects. Or you can use spotlight mode, which means the drone stays in a stationary position while the camera stays locked on to a moving subject. The active track modes can make life a lot easier when it comes to filming yourself or a subject and can make for some really interesting looking cinematic shots. My fourth tip is having a shot list. Whether this is something you remember mentally or you have physically written down, if you have a handful of shots that you can quickly smash out whenever you hit a location, that means you can spend the rest of your flight getting creative and you can play around with different drone controls and camera movements. This could either be three or four shots or it could be 10. It just comes down to what you're shooting and the type of shots you like. Here are five of my go-to shots. If you know exactly what you're going to be filming, you could write a detailed shot list in advance. But if you're like me, I never really know what I'm going to be shooting. So I always just rely on having those go-to shots in the bag so I know I'm going to have something to work with. Last but not least, my final tip is an important one, and that's shooting conditions, which is crucial to getting that cinematic look. The difference between a scene that looks good or bad usually comes down to the lighting conditions. The best time to shoot is in the mornings or afternoons, or even better, sunrise and sunset. This is when natural lighting is at its softest, which produces a nice balance between the highlights and the shadows to create more depth and richer colours in your scene. If we shoot in the middle of a sunny day, this is when the lighting is at its harshest, meaning there will be a strong contrast between the shadows and the highlights, which can make your shot look flat and blown out. When the weather is overcast, this isn't actually a bad thing. Cloud cover diffuses light from the sun, meaning you can usually shoot any time of the day and you'll get some decent results. It can also bring a more dramatic and atmospheric tone to your shots, which is what you could be going for. Thanks for watching guys, if you found this video helpful don't forget to like and subscribe, and if you have any questions or any other videos you'd like to see, drop your thoughts in the comments below.